Well, thanks for joining us. Today I'll be going over the Excuse me, just got to fix audio. All right, so today I'll be going over the um, tabletop simulator module that's available on uh, Workshop in Steam. You can download it now and play it. I'd just like to go over some components because maybe there are some questions um, around that I can help out with. So I'll go over the components, how to play using Tabletop Simulator. Um, and if anyone has any questions that is watching the stream, uh, feel free to um, shout out in the chat and we'll try to answer those questions the best I can. Um, and we'll, we'll keep this uh, Tabletop Simulator module updated um, regularly. So keep checking back for, for new things as we revise and add things. So I'm just gonna go over the board um, that you see in front of us here. We have the uh, main sector board, which is right in the middle. We have all the player stations, which include their individual ship dashboards, their velocity board. Um, we have over here the modules that you can add to your ships. We have the crew cards that you can add to your ship, specialist crew cards. And here are various um, tokens that can be added to the sector board. And we also have uh, the rule book. The rule book is the, uh, where it says Velocity Vanguard rules. Um, and if any time you want to open that, you know, great feature here is you don't have to actually go and zoom in on the page. You can actually just click on this button and you'll get that to pop out. So you can actually have it open while you're playing um, if you want to review the rules as you go along. And again, we'll keep this updated. Um, and also include um, things that are, may be specific to Tabletop Simulator um, in these rules. Um, then below the uh, uh, rule book or next to it, in the case of if it's near the box, we have the uh, mission guide. Um, so this has two mission briefs in it at this point. Um, again, we'll be adding to this um, for Tabletop Simulator um, so that you can try out different missions um, as we add them. But each page of this will include um, how you set up a particular mission. And the one you see here, for example, is called Flashpoint. And it gives you instructions on where to put different components. Like, for example, we have the space station that's pointing at a hex on the sector board that's labeled 3216. So, and there's also an arrow on the uh, space station. So that's where you would point the arrows to that hex. Um, things that are symmetrical, like the asteroids don't have arrows, so you can place any of the outer hexes on the hex that it's pointing to, and they all have labels. And in some cases, you'll be asked to place your ships. So here we have a layout, uh, for example, placement of ships of the different factions. And looking at the top of this uh, mission briefing, we have the background. So this is the story um, where we set up why you're um, going to engage in this mission, um, what the end of the mission is, and um, alternate options. For example, in this case, we have a beginning level of this mission, um, but there's also an experience mission um, objective here. Um, also talks about player count. So this can support one to four players and highlights what components you'll need for this particular mission. And every mission will be configured in this way. Um, so we'll have uh, more to it than what you see here. Um, but every mission will be configured this way um, and they'll usually cover uh, one page. So that is the mission briefing. So going over the other components that we have here in front of um, each player dashboard, we have the, um, the uh, player guides that are really handy. These would be uh, like double the size of a playing card um, lengthwise and have instructions for how the rounds operate, how um, ship, ship activation works, and how taking damage and ship loss works. So it's a quick reference. Um, so you, rather than having the rule book open, you can simply zoom in on any of these cards and get some instructions quickly. And then for each 
um, ship dashboard, we have also added the like the uh, I, um, sorry the tokens that you'll likely use, including uh, torpedoes, uh, which are these larger uh, tubular shape uh, weapons. Then you have the missiles. We have railgun darts, and we have mines. Um, and as we um, expand the module list that are available for this demo, there may be additional uh, tokens that appear here. On your velocity board, you have your vector tokens. Um, so in the demo, you have two ships that you can work with per faction. So there are two uh, vector tokens, um, one larger than the other. So you can stand these next to each other to get a feel for what they look like. So the smaller one represents the smaller ship with the two hexes. The larger one represents the uh, battle cruiser with the three hexes. Then you have the um, ship dashboards themselves, which come already loaded with um, all these status cubes you'll need to protect your shield, your hull, and your reactor, as well as energy uh, preloaded into your integrated capacitors. Um, the module slots are empty. Um, so they're for you to fill in based upon what you'd like to load out for the particular mission. And then below that we have the crew um, that will go along with your um, ship. They start off down in crew recovery at the beginning of your game. They'll move up into the available crew, which I'll show you in a moment. And then we have over here the first player token. This goes to whoever the first player is and gets passed around. Uh, in a clockwise fashion. And we also have some handy dandy bags for additional energy. So as you are spending energy, you can simply drag out of the bag. You can even use that to toss your spent energy in if you'd like. Um, but I just usually make a habit of putting the energy up here as I spend it. We also have extra uh, status cubes. And those come into play when you start loading your modules because each module will take a status cube um, as uh, its kind of relative health. So that's the kind of the overview of the board and all the th you know, things that generally you'll be using. Um, so I'm going to get into some specifics on how to um, uh, play. And for that, um, what I'll do is start picking modules and fitting out a ship. So I'll pick the Proximi as an example. And if I look at my ship, um, my two ships that I have available, I have the Battle Cruiser and I have the Strike Scout. The Strike Scout is smaller, it has less um, energy to spend, um, fewer uh, stats compared to the Battle Cruiser, um, but also has uh, two uh, module slots. And these module slots um, represent either two small or one large. So if you look at the Battle Cruiser, you have a, a four. That represents you can have four small or two large. So I'm going to go ahead and pick some modules over here, um, some common ones. I'll pick the particle cannon, bring that over here, and place it. Oh, hi, Joe. I see your hand. Um, place it on the module, and then I'll go ahead and grab the um, no, not the jammer. Let me get the, let's go with the mine launcher. Drag that over here. And then I'm going to get a particle cannon. And sorry, particle turret that's over here. So I have a particle cannon and a particle torque. So if the modules fit in this space, you can mount it. So you could um, have any combination of large or small modules. So you can place um, these in any order that you like, and they're placed in what you call module slots. And those module slots are important when it comes to uh, taking damage. So um, Generally speaking, the ones at the top are more vulnerable in, um, in each module bay than the ones uh, below. So um, the order may matter when it comes to rolling dice, um, but a large module, generally speaking, is equally vulnerable. 
So I've placed those two modules on the ship dashboard. Oops. And now I'm going to take a couple of status cubes and place them on the modules. And what that's doing is saying, well, each of these modules are healthy. To start off the game, they are a healthy module. So um, as long as there are status cubes, or as long as there is at least one status cube on a module, that module is available to use by your crew. Okay. So now I have my modules loaded um, on this battle cruiser, and I'd like to now go recruit some specialist crew. And um, in the demo here, you have up to nine um, se separate, um, sorry, eight special, eight separate crew specialists that you can pick from. You have engineers, droids, physicists, uh, systems, support, ambassadors, or munitions. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and pick, um, say, systems. And what that does is it it provides. Um, that any, um, sorry, any guided munitions may start with a plus one timer when launched. Um, if it, if you use a specialist to activate this um, card, then you can remove one timer from a guided weapon within uh, six spaces. Um, or you can have support, which is a shield expert. This allows me to repair two shield slots when using a specialist versus um, um, just one, which is the normal ability to repair shields. So let's take that one and bring it over. And I'll place that in front here. And you'll notice that on the ship dashboards, there are icons. And these icons represent the stats and how many crew you can have. So starting from the left, you have one uh, navigation crew, which is the circle without the edges on it. Um, then you have um, two specialist crew those are with the um, sharp edges you can have two specialist crew cards um, i've just placed my first and every round you can recycle um, i'm sorry refresh up to two crew members so as um, as crew, um, sorry uh, recycle up to two crew as you spend a crew they are uh temporarily exhausted and need to go to crew recovery so you would bring them back um, like so, making them available. And on this ship, I can reco um, re recover up to two crew from crew recovery. So I'm going to go ahead and pick another uh, crew. And I'll pick droids this time. Droids allows me to repair hull. So they are actually hanging out on the outside of the ship. And they'll start repairing things um, as I activate them. Um, more efficiently than what I could do from the inside of my ship. So the droids allow um, for some structural integrity. integrity. Uh, repairing a hull slot costs one less energy when using a specialist. Um, or you can directly repair a hull for free uh, by using a specialist crew. So that's how, that's how you would pick your specialist crew from the available list. Um, and sometimes, depending upon the mission, that might be a draft. But in this case, what I'm going to do is place them neatly near my um, ship dashboard. And in Tabletop Simulator, um, I like to have this appear as though it would be in the real game. So a quick way to get those cards underneath the dashboard is to unlock the um, ship dashboard temporarily, and then press the U key to move that card underneath. And then you can press the U key on this one to move it underneath that card. So now they're neatly stacked. You can, you only have to see the abilities of the cards up top. And it presents an available crew area. So as you are recovering crew, that's where you'd place them. So now I'm going to go ahead and lock these things because they'll be there for the duration of play. And I'll move my crew members into the available crew slots. So now this ship is ready to go, except I got to get my modules back. So sometimes that happens. Um, now the ship is ready to go. It has modules loaded. It has available crew, um, has energy. So that ship's ready to go. So for the strike scout, I'm going to add something different, a missile launcher this time. 
And Missilatra is a um, module that actually uses um, at munitions. And in this case, surprisingly, it uses missiles as munitions. Um, and I can see by the card that the ammo icon says uh, three ammo. That means I take three missile stacks here. And I'll explain the stacks in a moment. Oops, seconds there. And that represents the three missiles that I have available for this module. And the reason why there are stacks of three is because that's how you keep track of how long they last on the board. So you'll see this icon says guided three. That means that this missile will be on the board for three rounds. And every round you just simply take a token off the stack. And when there are no more tokens left, um, that missile has expired. Um, since I also have a mine launcher, I'm going to grab that ammo as well. And that's over here. I can take three of these and place them near my ship over here. So once I'm out of any of this ammo, I can no longer use that module. Um, so though that's my ship loaded uh, with modules. I'm going to go ahead and grab one specialist crew for the strike scout because that's what it can support. And that will be, let's go with guided specialist. The one I, I talked about earlier because guide specialist is really useful if you have um, anything that is guided. It lets you add an extra token to the stack of your munitions. So I'm going to do the same thing I did with the um, previous uh, card and tuck that neatly under the the uh, ship dashboard and then lock it in place and then go ahead and relock everything else. This way everything stays still as we play because I'm sure you all know with Tabletop Simulator things can move around and jostle. So now the um, Strike Scout is ready to go. Okay, then a couple of uh, other things. Now, if you're using two ships in any uh, game, you'll have two tokens and they can stack on top of each other. So as you move the vector tokens around, you may be cases where they have to stack and that's okay. That's what they're there for. Um, they may be going the same relative velocity um, um, yet they still may be in different positions on the board. Um, and you'll notice that the way these ships are facing is the same way that the vector token is facing. That represents which um, way it's pointing, but not necessarily the way it's going. Okay. So in Tabletop Simulator, um, the, in, in the way the game works, um, the, rounds, um, the rounds go as follows. Every player takes a turn activating one of their ships. So if you have one ship, two ships, or three ships, um, on your turn, you can activate one ship. At that point, you would decide whether or not you would do any navigation action, because navigation action has to occur first. So in this case, I like to get my battle cruiser moving, so I'll place that on the navigation slot. And for the Archon Battle Cruiser, I can apply a maximum of three thrust um, and a maximum of two rotation. Um, all that costs energy, so if this isn't free, I'll have to spend energy to make that happen. So now I'll decide what I'd like to do. So I will spend three energy to move my um, Battle Cruiser three, not move my Battle Cruiser, move the vector token three spaces in the direction of the arrow. So you can only ever move when you're thrusting um, your vector token in the, in the direction that the arrow is facing. Um, that kind of controls how maneuverable your ship is. So in this case, I spent three energy to move it three spaces forward. And then I'll spend another one to rotate it. So that kind of gives us the path of where the um, ship will be at the end of its movement. At this point, I haven't moved my ship. I still have some decisions to make. So before we go ahead and move the ship, I'm going to make one more decision since I have one energy left. 
I'm going to place a specialist crew on the particle cannon. Now, I don't have enough energy to activate the particle cannon. I really don't have anything to shoot at yet. Um, but the energy required to uh, fire the particle cannon is three. But I only have one left. That's okay, because I don't need to uh, fire that particle cannon right now. I can choose to fire it at a later date uh, by putting a crew on it and putting energy to charge it. Um, so I can charge it, which is as much as I like, up to the maximum that the uh, particle cannon requires to fire. And it can sit there like that until I'm ready to use it. So this is great for getting your energy um, used uh, to put idle crew to work and to have that module ready to use at the time you need it. Because not only can I use this module on my turn, I can use it on anybody else's turn. So let's say somebody's ship was cruising along past my line of fire, I can choose as they're moving to fire that um, module or activate that module and then do some damage. So again, I don't need to wait till my turn to um, activate a module, um, but I can only charge them on my turn. The downside about having uh, the crew on this module is that they have to stay there until I use it. Um, so every round that crew would stay on this module until I decide to use it. Um, so preparing ahead of time is good if you if you think you're going to be engaged in a few rounds, um, but not too far ahead. This way you don't have a crew that you can't use uh, to take actions. If for some reason you decide eh, I can do better things with that crew, you can decide to take them off and move them to crew recovery and exhaust the energy that was uh, being held there. And now the next round that crew is available and it goes back into uh, available crew. So for now, I'm going to keep that crew there and keep it charged. And now I need to move my ship. So tabletop simulator, um, has a little bit of automation built into it um, in determining your your flight path. And your flight path allows you to um, move around the board um, using velocity, turning and drifting. Um, you can, for example, come by and as you're turning, fire and continue to drift by. Really neat uh, physics-based mechanic. Um, that's a lot of fun to play with and also use strategically on the board. But what um, Tabletop Simulator is doing for us here is it's adding the place where your ship will be at the end of its movement. So when it comes time to move your ship, you're going to move your ship at one hex along the path to that final destination and then align it to that rotation. So we do that because the vector token is here and it represents the path that you'll move. So in the physical game, you'll be using these tokens to do the same. So rather than have Tabletop Simulator do it for you, you would take these um, uh, velocity helper tokens and place them on the board. In this case, I'll just place it on the same place and rotate it so that you know where you'll be at the end of the next round. And you can even just go ahead and place the uh, ship on top of that token. So whether you're playing uh, physically or playing um, with Tabletop Simulator, you try to match what the experience would be, except Tabletop Simulator does provide some automation when it comes to uh, figuring out what your next position is going to be. All right, so that's how I move. Now I move my ship to the next spot. And then we'd go around, act, take turns activating ships. After you've activated a ship, you would then flip your activation token. That's important because if there's a, more than a few ships on the board, then everyone knows and they can at a glance see which ship has been activated for that turn. And so everyone will go around activating their ships, taking their actions with the crew, possibly charging modules to use on other people's turns, and that, that's called reactions. Uh, once all ships have been uh, activated, then the, the, um, anything that's on the board would move, and I'll go over that in a few moments. So that means there may be other things besides ships on this board and big asteroids. There could be missiles, there could be asteroids, there could be um, other things um, that, that are driven by the mission. And they're on the board and they have their own behavior. And all their 
movement, all their things that they do will occur at the end of the round after all the players have activated their ships. So after all the, the, the components on the board activate, then um, it's the end of the round and you would refresh any crew that you had in the crew recovery it would come to, um, from crew recovery up into available crew up to the uh, um, refresh limit. In this case, again, this is two for this ship and two for this ship. We would then flip the activation tokens back over, recover your energy, I'm sorry, not that one, recover the energy um, from your reactor to your capacitor. And in this case, I still have a healthy reactor that's gonna give me five energy each round. So I place that there. So every round, this integrated capacitor will be filled to its maximum if I have the maximum um, reactor strength. Um, if I didn't, let's say I had one less reactor cube for whatever reason, because I was damaged in some way, then on the beginning of that round, I can only generate four. B, the way your maximum capacitor doesn't change. So if you had two left over or three left over from the previous round, um, then you would still be able to fill that capacitor up to its maximum as well. And in all cases, if you have a module that's being charged, that energy stays on that module. That will never be taken away from you unless you choose to um, use that module or exhaust that crew and then um, lose the, the energy off the uh, shipboard. Okay. So that's every round you go through and again, activate your ships, make decisions on what things you're going to um, use for actions and um, move your ship along that path and decide when you're going to activate things. Okay, so a couple other actions, um, again, that are up here and some differences in how you can use the, the crew of, of the different color that you see here, the gray and the red. Um, the gray represent and the um, smooth edge represent navigation crew. Now, nav navigation crew is the only crew that can pilot the ship. Specialists were not trained to do that. So you need to use your navigation crew to pilot your ship. But navigation crew can do everything else on your ship. So it can uh, repair shields, I'm sorry, regenerate shields, repair a hull, repair reactor, activate modules, and it can also uh, repair modules. Um, specialist crew can do everything but um, navigation. So they can do all the things on your ship, including activate modules. But in some cases, they do things better. So for example, if you look at, um, I'm gonna move this up here for a moment. If you look at support, there's two options and benefits I get from having this specialist crew card attached to my ship. Uh, number one, it's a shield expert. So when I choose to place this specialist crew on shield, I'm gonna take away some shields, for example. A, the specialist crew can repair two shield slots instead of just one for one energy. So very efficient way of regenerating energy by using specialist crew. The other way you can use a specialist crew um, is by using its active ability, which is in this case is repair shield. And a lot of these cards, most of these cards have active abilities. And I would just simply place that um, specialist crew token on the repair shield action on the card. And I get to repair a shield for, uh, for free. So it costs no energy. So you, if you're in a tough spot, you don't have much energy, but you do have some specialist crew left, you can use them to repair a shield um, and uh, vice versa. If you did have some energy, just like to get some more efficient use out of it and save some energy for other things, you can use a specialist to um, repair shields and get an extra benefit there. And a lot of, car, a lot of the cards have a similar um, application in that way for their own specialties. Okay. So those are the crew. Again, navigation crew can is the only crew that can navigate your ship. The um, specialist crew can um, use any other ability on your ship plus their own specialist crew actions. Okay. So now I'm going to go ahead and show you how um, the modules work. So I'll set up a quick instance here with two battle cruisers facing off.
So here we have a Proxamai battle cruiser facing off against a Rift battle cruiser. And I'm going to point out some differences in these two ships, actually. We have <clears throat> both the battle cruisers have a footprint of three hexes. So that represents kind of relative size for what they are. But you notice that the Rift battle cruiser has its center of mass in the rear, where the Proxima battle cruiser has the center of mass in the middle. That dictates what how they'll rotate as you're moving them through space. So in this case, your um, Rift battle cruiser handles a little differently, and you need to account for that additional turn radius from the middle. Um, sorry, from the back of the ship, where the Proxima battle cruiser will rotate around. Um, its center of uh, center of mass. So, um, and this is a good point to bring up. A very important thing you need to know about Tabletop Simulator is that there is a rotation degrees in the top right of your Tabletop Simulator. That should be set to 60 for playing uh, Velocity Vanguard because it is a hex-based system that has six degrees, <coughs> six ways of facing. And uh, by setting your rotation degrees to 60, that makes it really easy to rotate your ships or tokens um, to face along the hex grid that you see on the game. Another helper I've noticed is that while you're holding the ship, sometimes the rotation will get kind of weird in Tabletop Simulator. That's really easy to fix. If it's not aligning for you for whatever reason as you picked it up, um, just drop it down. There we go, here's a perfect example. Drop it down on the board. Don't even try picking it up again. And then just hit the Q or E to fix it um, back into that, that rotation. Um, the Q and E in, in the case of Tabletop Simulator are rotate left and, sorry, rotate right and rotate uh, left. Okay. So here we have two ships facing off. And actually, I'm going to get this one in the mix as well. So here we have two ships facing off. And let's say it's my. Uh, turn to activate a ship. I'm going to go ahead and um, activate my Archon Battle Cruiser because this shows me I can use my particle cannon because this ship is in a straight line in the line of path, in the, I'm sorry, in the line of sight to my ship. And the line of sight um, is actually can you um, follow any of the hex paths to your target? So in this case, I am going through the front of this uh, um, Rift Battle Cruiser um, by its right through the front hex of its ship. If for some reason, let's say I'm going to move this over here. If I move this over here, and this ship was here, although it's on the same path. It has to go through a large asteroid, so that would not be in line of sight. So if I wanted to target that ship with a, say, a beam weapon that comes out of the front of my ship, I could not do that. Same thing if there was a, for example, just another ship in the way. So let's say um, his ally there was in the way. I wanted to hit this ship. Well, with, with a, the particle beam, um, I can't do that because it's in the way. But if you look at the particle cannon, it has two modes of fire. It has the, the beam, which is the one on the bottom, and it can do uh, three point of damage all the way across the board, all the way across the sector board, so up to infinity. Um, you'll always be able to hit if that ship that you're targeting is directly in, in front of your ship on that line of hex. And if it does, it does three damage. Um, but because this smaller ship is in the way, and I really don't mind doing damage to it in the process. I can use the sweep mode of the um, particle cannon. And the particle cannon sweep mode lets me hit every ship within the front arc of uh, my ship to a range of six hexes. So you'll see it says range six. Um, it does less damage because I'm using the beam across the arc, so there's less energy hitting any ship, but I can hit every ship in the process. So the front arc and the targeting from any ship and when it's coming from the front is based upon the hex that is directly in front of the front hex of the ship. So here we have the three hexes of the ship. 
then we have this hex in front. So if any ship is within six hexes, that's one, two, three, four, five, six, right there, right there, and they're in this arc of that six, those six hexes, that means that they will be affected by that sweep. So all ships within that arc would, in this case, take two damage. Versus if it was a beam and the ship was now, let's say, across the board here, I would then fire my particle cannon and be able to hit it directly there. So, and again, the same thing would happen if I was moving. So let's pretend I am actually moving this time. And I will move my token over here. Oh, this is a great example. So let's say I had, I'm gonna move it up. This is a really good example. I'm gonna move it up over here and reset my token so you can see where it's going. So here we have two ships that are minding their own business, um, but I am minding theirs. And I'm moving in this direction uh, towards the blue hex with the arrow. And let's say I have charged up my both my particle cannon and my particle tort. So now that is those two are ready to go. I have energy on my particle turret. I have a crew on that. Um, I have energy on my particle cannon. I have crew on that. They're all maxed out as far as energy that they need to trigger. Perfect situation. Now, as I move my ship, I can decide at any point, any hex of movement. So from the beginning, before I move, any hex along this movement to the final hex. And even before or after rotation, because in Velocity Vanguard, um, when you rotate your ship, you always apply that rotate, you, move, you rotate the ship at the end of the movement. So it could be before or after that rotation. Now in this case, case, I'm just drifting along this way. So right at the beginning, because um, this ship is in, in my direct line of fire, I'm going to trigger the particle cannon. Great. So after, when I trigger my particle cannon, that's going to do three damage immediately to um, the, that Rift Battle Cruiser. And we re you resolve each individual module at the moment you do it. So you don't you're not going to stack modules and then go tick tick them one at a time. You're going to choose to spend that action right now. In this case, I'll be spending the energy off that module. I'll be moving the crew to crew recovery, and then that rift battle cruiser would take that damage. Then I continue my movement along that path. And again, that's why we have those helper tokens there. So it kind of reminds you of where you're going to be. And when I get here, um, I'm also going to release my particle tort. I could have done that from a little further distance, but as an example um, of using two different modules along the path, I'll use the particle tort here. And the particle tort is smaller with less range, but also costs me less energy, so it's easier to charge up. I'll exhaust that energy and move the crew into crew recovery. And I'll move this guy down here at the same time. And now I've fired the particle turret. And now that ship takes two damage. So on one action, as I'm moving through the space um, of the sector board, I can activate those modules. So that's great. Great for strategizing. Great for thinking about how you're going to um, charge up your modules and optimize and spend your energy. Um, it's it's you're making a decision along every hex of movement if you want to you don't have to you can you can do it all at the end if you like if you're within range or um, if you have nothing to do in that particular hex but it gives you great flexibility in in how you're going to change the state of the board as you're as you're moving now if for some reason everyone else is moving let's say I finish my movement here and now it was this. Uh, Strike Scout's turn. And I'll, I'll show you where that will end up as an example. Oh, that's the wrong token. Let me get the right token. There we go. So let's say that ship is going to end up at, here at the end of its movement. Now it's the Rift, it's a Strike Scout turn. So as the blue player, as the Proxima uh, player, 
I'm paying attention to what this what this small strike scout's doing because it may present an opportunity for me to react as it's moving. I'm sure I'm sure that strike scout has something planned for me, but in the meantime, I'm going to take an opportunity to hit it. So let's pretend I didn't spend that um, particle cannon that time against the strike scout uh, against the battle cruiser. And it still had its three energy on there because in order to use this as a reaction, it must be charged and I must have crew on it. So let's pretend I didn't use it earlier and I'm waiting for the right moment because right now this ship is not in my line of fire. It's back of space. So I can't hit it with my part, at least the strongest part of it. So I'm going to wait until that player's turn and they decide to move. And as soon as they cross the hex that I, I'd like to trigger my reaction, I say, reaction, I'm going to fire my particle cannon at you as you go by, and immediately you exhaust your um, particle cannon, and they would take uh, three damage uh, right off the bat. Then they would continue along their path and do what they were going to do. So again, you can um, d use modules on your turn um, as you're moving or as other people are moving, um, and that's if it goes for any, any player on, on the board. Um, you can also use it f for the sector board. So here's an example where let's say there was a missile chasing me down and I'll find an enemy one for now. There we go. I'll use this as an example. Let's say that strike scout had fired a missile and they fire that missile just before they start moving. Just before, let's say, I start, I was able to fire on it in the last turn. Then they go ahead and move this direction. That missile is deployed where they decide to deploy it and doesn't move until all the other ships have gone. So now let's say all the other ships have gone and it's um, time for all these sector board components to move, including the missile. So then that player would move this missile up to its maximum spaces, which is six. So we get to there. Um, if this was going to, let's say it was on its last leg, there's only one token left and it was on its way and it was close enough to hit my ship. And I had saved that particle turret up and I didn't use it on, the sh on that other ship. I could then fire the particle turret as that missile got closer to um, hit it for uh, one timer and that then would be off the board, and that missile would no longer be a threat. So again, you can use your actions, um, your reactions, sorry, on modules that have been charged and have crew on it at any point um, after you've done so on anyone's turn or even the sector board's turn. Okay. And um, for those who are watching, if you have any questions as you go along, uh, feel free to put them in the chat, and I'll try to answer them the best I can. I think Joe is here to also help out with that. Okay, so now I'm going to go over how you would um, deploy missiles. Now I gave an example with that small ship. Let's take a look at the missile launcher again. So let's say in my turn I had charged this missile launcher for two and I placed a crew there and I decide to deploy the missile. So I'm going to go ahead and grab this token and bring it over to my strike scout. But let me move my strike scout back here and we'll use this as an example again. So when you deploy a missile um, on any ship that has a missile launcher or a torpedo launcher or a mine launcher, anything that is what we call a deployable, right? So if you're deploying a missile, that token is deployable. You deploy it adjacent to any hex that is adjacent to your center of mass. <clears throat> so in the case of the Strike Scout, we have uh, the center of mass in the back. You would deploy it next to any hex that is adjacent to your center of mass. So you can even deploy this missile out of the back if you wanted to. And by the way, very useful if someone's chasing you um, to deploy missiles out of the back hex. But let's say in this case, I'd like to have this go after this uh, Rift Strike Scout. 
which is moving, by the way, very swiftly along this path. So I can choose to deploy it on any hex, but what would make sense at this point would be to put it closer to the ship that I'm wanting to hit it with it, and also turn it so it's facing the direction I like, like it to go. Um, this is a physical-based board game. It's based upon somewhat realistic physics in a, in, a, in a 2D world where you should lead your targets. Um, you should lead your targets if you're trying to shoot it at long distance um, with railgun darts and even with missiles because missiles can only go so far and none of your potential targets are static. They're not sitting there waiting for you to hit them. So you have to, you should lead your target whenever you're you know, planning your, your module activations. So in this case, this missile gets deployed here. Now, it's not the end of the turn yet. And let's say it was the Rift's player's turn next to then activate things. And let's say they had their own particle turret. Um, they decide to activate it now and take a timer off of my missile. So now my missile is only going to last two rounds instead of three. They then move their ship. Um, and I'll pretend they're going to rotate it and not crash into that asteroid. Then all the other ships have gone. Now it's the missile's turn because that's when, again, the sector board activates and the missiles are part of the sector board. So as you are moving through uh, space, you can then move the missile. And the missile has specs where it says it can move up to six spaces and rotate up to two for every hex that it moves. So nothing is really infinitely agile in, in space. There's some restrictions on how it can move. So even missiles have a limit. Um, they're probably the most agile thing within Velocity Vanguard at the moment. Um, so again, a missile kid can, for any given hex that it moves, rotate two hexes. So it can basically turn it around on itself in two turns if, it, if you wanted to do that. Could be useful, let's say, if you're miss if you accidentally placed your missile here, you wanted to go around uh, the curve of your ship to get to the, the target. Um, you can do that. Um, if you wanted to go around an asteroid, you can certainly do that. Um, other uh, modules have, um, for example, torpedo are less agile. Um, so other ones that we haven't disclosed yet may be more agile. But in this case, the missile will now move its distance one, two, three four, five. And in the missile's case, it can move up to six. So in six spaces, it's now overlapped a hex of the ship. It could be any hex of the ship. It could be the front hex, back, back hex. It could be um, any, any hex of the ship is considered the ship profile. If you overlap that hex, it's made contact and then it, it detonates whatever the, um, whatever the effect is. In the case of the missile, it does three damage. So I would take the missile off the board then this ship would take three damage. If he was a little more, a little further away, let's say there, um, and it could, that my uh, missile could not make its distance all the way here. So it, ma it makes it just shy, can't hit this time. It's getting closer, um, but maybe next time. Um, well, I've, now I've moved the missile, I now take a token off of it. Let me fix that real quick. Um, I now take a token off of it because that's the end of the round. Um, the missile ha now has one more turn to go to try to catch up to this um, strike scout. And if it does, it will make contact and explode. So that's how you move ships. Let's say the ship was here now. And the next round, I can move it along this path and then finally make contact. So missiles, are, missiles and torpedoes and mines... <clears throat> And other things that you actually move around on the board um, and control as a as a player uh, controller um, have different kind of guidelines on how you would how you move them limitations. So again, the missile in the case of the missiles, it can move up to six hexes. It can turn up to two for every hex that it moves. It can last for three rounds and it does three damage. And we take a look at the torpedo, which is right up here. I'll bring that up. So a torpedo is like the big cousin of the missile, on, uh, the missile launcher. 
um, but it's slower as well. So it's it's guided, just like a missile is. But instead of only lasting for three rounds, it lasts for five rounds. So you're taking one token off at the end of each round, and then five rounds later, that torpedo is going to expire. Um, downside is it's slower. It can only move up to four hexes per round, and it's less agile. It can only turn one hex angle per per hex. So it's it can still kind of go in a circle. Uh, but it's not as flexible as the missile is. But it does a lot of damage. So if you can make contact with the torpedo, it's going to do five damage. That's, that is significant. Um, and also this missile launcher, uh, torpedo launcher, comes with three of those torpedoes. So that is the torpedo launcher. That is how the missile launchers work. Um, I've kind of gone over uh, many of the components. But one thing that you should check um, in every round of play is what your passive abilities are. So, for example, um, for these missiles, if I look up at my um, system specialist, I'm sorry, my systems one, I have a guided specialist. That means my guided munitions may start with one timer, plus one timer, when launched. So instead, in this case, that missile would have lasted for four rounds instead of just three, because I have the guided specialist. On top of that, um, this systems one comes with a guidance hack that allows you to kind of jam an incoming missile. So if a missile is on its way to hit you, besides using countermeasures like the particle turret or the jammer, you can also use guidance hack. You place a specialist um, on that space and you get to remove a timer from any incoming um, guided munitions. Again, guided munitions would be things like torpedoes and missiles, something that the player controls and has timers on it. So that's very flexible. And again, none of those cards have abilities that lead us like that. So that covers most of uh, how you would play um, Velocity Vanguard. We have on this TTS uh, again, as a reminder, this um, TTS module is available on Steam. We have um, a number of modules to pick from um, that work well with the missions that you can play that are built in here. We'll be adding missions um, to this book as we go. We have um, up to eight specialist crews, different kinds. Um, each one has their own special use. Um, and the tokens over here, well, all these tokens are not necessarily used within uh, the missions that you see available now. We've made them available here as well. Um, so you can also experiment and set up situations where you'd like to try some things with, with your friends or play the missions. So you can even use this um, to do a, a skirmish or a team-based mission if you'd like. And... That kind of covers the overview. Now I'm going to dig down a little deeper and go into damage because we haven't covered damage. I've done a lot of damage to these rift ships. So let's use them as an example of taking a damage. So I'll zoom in on the both the uh, rift ships. We have the Ramistus, Bowcruz, and the Jovai. And while I'm here, I'm going to go ahead and grab these dice because when it comes to taking damage, um, that's where some randomness may, may come into play. You have your shields, which are the things that protect you without affecting your physical ship. It's a unique shield system that um, these um, humans that have left Earth, Earth have adopted. It's not like a, a shell around your ship. It is an electromagnetic system that prevents damage by um, incoming threats. Um, and it has limited ability to do so. So every damage that you take, you'll remove a status cube and if you run out of shields this icon that you see here represents damage to your hull so let's say you take three damage and you only had two shields left um, the damage would not stop at the shield right I would take two off for the for two of those damage and then I'd still have one damage left well that would immediately get applied to the hull. So fortunately in this case, 
and in most cases, the first hull slot is kind of a free, a warning shot where um, no additional um, no additional um, effect happens to your ship. But if you start taking additional hull damage, you'll reveal dice icons. And let's say we had taken an additional two. So on that round, I was dealt two damage. It took two hull away and in the process revealed these two dice icon with the, with the uh, times one. So really what that means is you're going to roll one die for that hull removed and then one die for that hull removed. So let me go ahead and roll those and we'll see what different effects we get. I'm going to roll those a couple of times actually. Great. So I have a blank, which means nothing happens. No additional effect to my ship. But then I have the A, and that represents the A module. And in the case of Strike Scouts, um, it has one module bay. Um, this module bay is actually represents A and B module slots. So if you roll an A or B on this module bay, you would end up removing a status cube from whatever is there. So I'll go ahead and grab this as an example. And um, that's important because when you remove status cubes from um, your modules, they may become unavailable to use. If you don't have status cube on the module um, and there's um, no cubes left on that module, that module becomes unavailable to use. So in this case, I rolled an A. That means I take one cube off of the module bay. I'll roll again as another example. Um, ooh, I rolled a B and an A, and it shows the um, reactor symbol. So in this case, the A would take off um, a status cube and the B would also take off the status cube but there are no status cubes left on this missile launcher so that means that I would also take off a reactor and if I had just ro rolled a, a reactor symbol I can find it here like here that would immediately take a reactor off as well so as you take damage to your hull, you would continue to roll dice. And in this case, if I took another damage to the hull, it's telling me I need to roll two. So I would pick two and roll two. If you get damaged and you have no hull, hull status cubes left, you would roll your damage times the number that's here in this last slot. So if I had three damage coming from a, a, hit, a missile or from a particle cannon, I would roll six dice. Um, so the risk increases as you lose hull um, to affecting your reactor. And two things happen if you lose reactor. One is you lose the ability to um, regenerate energy. So every round, instead of generating four, if this was a healthy reactor, I'm only generating three. Or if I had two left, I would only generate two. But once you get down to the last one, your reactor goes critical and your ship explodes. It disintegrates, so that ship is then be destroyed, um, and you can no longer use that ship. However, we've taken all this damage, but I haven't done anything to mitigate that. So that's where, again where your your crew comes in to start helping things along. You can use your crew in multiple different ways as you are playing. You can apply crew to repair shields. You can spend any number of energy and repair that many shields. If you're using a specialist and you have that special um, systems, or no, the support card, you could then then repair two energy per energy spent. So it's pretty easy um, by using crew to re regenerate shields. Um, but again, you're using that energy cost and you're using crew member to do that. So you can't do other things um, that you would like to do, but it's a good way to keep, keep your shields up. You can repair your hull by placing either of these tokens on that action and it costs two energy to repair one hull you can only repair one hull at a time 
by using your um, crew and spending energy. Or you can use your crew to repair the reactor in the same fashion. You can repair a reactor for two. Now there are crew specialist cards that you can attach to your ship that make that more efficient to do. Um, so feel free to uh, look at those cards and see how they work. Um, but there is one more thing you can do um, is you can take your crew and if you have a module that was uh, been, has been destroyed, or sorry, disabled, you can repair that module for the cost of the activation. So instead of using two to activate that missile launch, I'm spending two to repair it. So that allows me to pull a cube onto the um, missile launcher and then it becomes enabled again. It costs two in this case to add one status cube. You can do it again to no add another status cube. And it always costs the amount that the module costs activated. So that's a good way to recover modules um, that you like. So there's always a way um, a very expense to use energy and use your crew um, to repair your ship. Um, so look at ways to do that as you're, as you have um, encounter battles. Um, one other thing that I didn't bring up during uh, damage to modules is that if you had, um, and this is a risk of charging modules, because charging modules requires that you actually use crew, is if you use crew to charge a module, let's say I have this missile launcher, it's all charged, ready to go, I'm waiting for the right moment to release that missile. Um, but I take damage to my hull, have to roll dice, and I roll a module, and then I lose my last status cube on that module. Well, the energy goes away. I can no longer fire that uh, missile, and the crew is lost. So the crew will be lost and not recoverable for that ship. So there's always a risk in, in leaving your crew in a module ready to go, especially if it's damaged in a way that removes all its status cubes. Um, however, if you're prepared to um, do that and you're going to be in, in tight battles where you think you're going to be losing a lot of shield, there is a specialist card for you called the Medic. And that Medic lets you recover lost crew. So instead of having a crew member lost in space in the void, you can recover that crew member and place them on this crew recovery track. Each round, that crew would re would move up the uh, the slots until it got to the last one. At the end of that round, you would take that crew back to available crew. Um, you can have up to um, three crew on that slot. So, you, if you if someone was occupying the first slot, you couldn't recover another crew. If that spot was open, you can have two crew in, re in recovery and so on. Um, so that is very useful in um, being able to recover crew that are hanging out on a lot of modules. Maybe not so much on these smaller ships, but yet when you get onto larger ships that have a lot of crew and maybe operating modules, uh, multiple modules at a time, and you may lose them in that battle. So that could be useful to save you from um, losing crew members that you can no longer use. Great. So again, just a re regroup here on what we have on Tabletop Simulator is we have the rule book again over here that goes over all the rules um, of how the um, game works. It also has details on the components that are included with the Kickstarter. Um, you get 12 different ship miniatures um, that, are that are specific to each faction. They all have their own color, so they don't need to be painted out of the box. They're ready to go for you to use and play with. Um, but feel free to paint them if you like. Um, that's what I do on the side. It's a lot of fun. Um, they come with vector vector token for each ship. They come with deployable tokens um, for each ship, over 200 of them. Um, you have the first player um, token. You have specialist crew cards. Um, there's um, 18 unique specialist crew cards and and there's three sets of those so that you can uh, customize your ships as you see fit um, between the specialist crew cards the modules and then the larger ship um, where you can implement command modules there are thousands of combinations thousands um, it's almost endless replayability 
um, in, in configuring your ship and approaching missions or even skirmish play in unique ways. And you have, um, again, this, this rule book applies to not just the um, tabletop version of the game, I'm sorry, tabletop simulator version of the game, but also the physical version. And really primarily that um, we do have uh, notes for where things are a little different in tabletop simulator to provide some um, additional useful functionality. But again, this rule book applies to both. And also everything you see here is not final as far as art and and writing and, and presentation. So do expect um, things to change as we um, get closer to finalizing um, the game for production. So if there's any questions from the group watching, I'm, I'll free, free, feel free to ask. Um, Joe, if you have anything you'd like me to cover, um, you can chime in now if you like. No, Larry, okay. I think you did a great job and I thank you. Well, with that, um, I'll kind of close this out. So again, as a reminder, Velocity Vanguard is live now on Kickstarter. You can check it out. Um, a lot of information on that page. You know, feel free to ask questions in the comments. Send us a message. Um, download the module off of Steam. You can find it in as in Velocity Vanguard on, on the Steam page. Um, you can comment. You can rate it there if you like. Um, and we'll keep that updated as we move through the Kickstarter and beyond, because uh, that'll be our primary way of sharing information and updates to the game and how it plays is through uh, that that module. Well, thank you very much again, everyone, for joining. Um, this will be somewhat edited down, hopefully cleaned up and placed on our YouTube channel. And I'll share that with everybody um, once that is done. But uh, thank you and have a good night.